Great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. I was having trepidation during the day that I scheduled a meeting um, on a Monday after a long holiday weekend. So um, thanks for thanks for coming. I'm glad that you all saw notice of this. Um, I'm Sue Fillion. I'm the planning director. Um, and with me today um, our presenters, Holly Parker and Emily Foster, who are from SLR Consulting. Um, this is our second meeting for the Brattleboro Walk Bike Action Plan. We had a meeting back in September um, and to kind of get some input. We also had an online map that many of you maybe um, put some comments down on as to areas, areas where you felt in town that there were some um, bottlenecks and, and, and safety concerns. Uh, for your walking around or bicycling around town. Um, so, Emily, can you uh, advance the slides? Yes. So a quick agenda for tonight. We're just going to um, go through the project timeline. We're kind of nearing the end of our project. Uh, what we're going to be presenting tonight to you is um, how to some some projects to connect our bicycling and walking infrastructure in town. So you'll see some projects that are in the works and also some recommendations that are coming out of this plan. We'll talk about proposed bicycle facilities proposed pedestrian facilities, and then we'll talk about implementation um, and also pro you know, potential sources of funding for projects in this. Um, I mentioned earlier that Holly Parker and Emily Foster are here. Uh, Brandy Saxton is also a member of the consultant team um, who has been doing some work on uh, the funding sources um, as well as providing some other guidance throughout the project. Um, if you are on Zoom, uh, you well, it, it looks like not everybody's muted. Um, if you would like to speak, um, best thing would be to, is to raise your digital hand because sometimes when we have slides up, we can't see all the physical hands. Um, and then you can also use the chat to type a question and we'll make sure that we cover them all. Um, next slide, please. I mentioned the project timeline. This project got started in June. We had a steering committee of um, people familiar, uh, both you know people that work with the town, planning commission members, some invited community members, a member from the Wyndham Regional Commission, um, who were kind of guiding some of the steps along the way. Um, we had the interactive mapping tool that maybe you participated, um, utilized over the summer. And then we had our first public meeting in September. Um, our consultants have been busy preparing the prioritization plan to share tonight. And um, our goal is to, in the next month or so, uh, present a plan to the select board for approval. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Holly. Thank you, Sue. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, <laughs> great. Oh, wait, we have one person who can't, you can't hear. You can't hear. Can we make it loud? No. Can okay. You, is this a microphone that you have here? Yes, let me just check that here. Uh, let me check my microphone. Is it someone in the room? Yeah. Yeah. I could try using the headset if that would be better. Is it coming at all? Do you want me to keep talking so you can see if the <laughs> volume changes? You can't hear me. Oh, wait a minute. I'll try. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Hang on a second. Everything on her ear. Okay, do it again. Please. Can you try again, Holly? Thanks, Sam, for affirming that it, it's okay there. But how, how is it now? It's better now. Better. Okay, I, I will speak up um, as long as my voice holds up. 
So the first thing we wanted to talk about is why, why are we recommending these specific bike and pedestrian facilities that we're gonna be talking about tonight? Um, it's because they reflect our, our desire to start making improvements that are inexpensive and incremental. So um, Sharrows, for example, this, this design on the street here um, that we have in a few locations in Brattleboro, we, we don't really consider them an actual bicycle facility, but they are an easy and inexpensive way to start building awareness that bicycles belong on our roads. In terms of the time frame, so we've we've broken down the recommendations that have come out of uh, the first public meeting and the comments that you have submitted um, or that many of you have submitted through our online interactive mapping tool um, and from conversations with the with the um, working group, the uh, advisory committee rather. So. What differentiates a short-term project from a long-term project is that, you know, a short-term project um, may already have some identified resources behind it. It, it may already be in process. Um, it's relatively inexpensive and it's possible within the existing right-of-way of the road um, or, or the roadway itself or the right-of-way that um, the town owns and it may not require a long time to complete. I, I mean, any or all of those could be factors. Uh, Long-term projects are kind of just the opposite of that. They would, um, in many cases, require additional study. They could have significant permitting or design challenges that you know, make them more complex. Um, they're rel relatively expensive and or require a longer time to complete. In terms of cost, we, we talked at the last public meeting a little bit about what the town's budget is for this bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. And, and we will do that, um, we'll, we'll show that slide again next, but um, we wanted to also give you some costs that are directly from VTRANS, um, their report on shared use path and sidewalk costs, um, but, and also bike lane costs. So just to, to give you a sense of, you know, what costs we're talking about, and in this case, they're talking about per foot. So you obviously have to multiply those numbers by, um, you know, the number of feet in a mile to get a mile of, of infrastructure, of sidewalk infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> for, for bike lane costs, um, thanks Emily. Yeah, I'll just talk about this last one here. Um, Waterborne paint is is what Brad, um, Brattleboro typically uses, and the cost per mile with a four foot white line that's the white shoulder line. So if you are completely repaving a road from scratch, you know you you did a you milled it down and and did a, a complete new repaving, um, you would need to add this this white line anyway. It's essentially the um, it's the it's the lane marking, the outer lane marking that that is different, uh, delineating between the shoulder and the travel lane. So, in some cases, that counts towards the project cost. In some cases, it doesn't because you are going to have to put it there anyway. But this is just to again to give you a little bit of a taste of of what the costs are. So. This is a slide from our last presentation. We we asked the question, so well, Sue, what is your budget in Brattleboro um, for sidewalk and pedestrian and bicycle improvements? Um, and this is how it breaks down in fiscal years 2023 and 2024. Um, and some of this is, is for specific projects. Some of it is for matching grant funds, but when you compare the amount that's available um, that's budgeted against the quarter mile of sidewalk improvements that were just made on on south main street for example um, you see that 
there's a, a bit of a gap <laughs> um, between what's available and what's you know what's needed um, in terms of bike lane striping. If if you average those two costs um, on the previous slide, you'd get about eight thousand six hundred dollars in cost for a quarter mile of lane striping. So you can see how far that would go given the existing budget. So I, I won't belabor this point because and we're going to talk at the end about opportunities for grant funding and um, other ways to pay for these kind of projects. And with that, I will pass the baton to Emily to talk about bike facilities. Thanks, Holly. Um, so we're going to go through um, a lot of information in these next couple of slides. So feel free. Um, to chat, to put a question in the chat or raise your hand at any point and we can stop and answer questions. Um, so the key to improving bike, biking conditions in Brattleboro is the development of a town-wide bicycle network. The recommended bicycle facilities that we are going to run through next uh, seek to complete this network. Um, they are the essential first two steps in the creation of a safe, comfortable, and connected network that will support existing bicyclists and also help to attract more uh, people to use bicycles to get around town. So um, to be able to zoom in more on the recommended facilities, we have changed the orientation of the maps. Um, so you will now um, see them in this orientation from now on um, with north being on the right hand side and south being on the left hand side just so that we could enlarge them more for this presentation. So these are the existing bicycle facilities within Brattleboro. Um, and um, so there are bike lanes on portions of Western Avenue near West Brattleboro, a short section of bike lanes on Guilford Street, bike lanes on a section of Putney Road, shared lane markings, also known as Sharrows on William Street. And then we have the West River Trail, which we are calling a shared use or multi-use path. Uh, there are some planned upcoming improvements that will help to extend the existing bicycle, bicycle facilities throughout town. Um, on Western Avenue, new bike lanes are proposed in West Brattleboro to connect the existing bike lanes to Sunset Lake Road. Additionally, new bike lanes are proposed on Western Avenue between Allerton Avenue and Green Street. Um, and bike lanes are proposed on Linden Street from West River Park to Park Place. And then with the Putney Road improvements um, that we talked a little bit about at the last presentation, bike lanes will be provided from Chesterfield Road to the West River. Okay, the envisioned short-term bicycle network includes mostly striping improvements that can be accomplished within the existing curb-to-curb -curb roadway with to create quick, relatively low cost and a basic bicycle network throughout town. Um, in 2017, the town studied the fe feasibility of providing continuous bicycle facilities on Western Avenue um, from he Edward Heights to High Street. This study included both near-term and long-term recommendations. Um, with the upcoming bicycle facilities, the town has started to fill the gaps on Western Avenue, but there are still a few areas that are missing facilities. So as part of the short-term improvements, it is recommended to install the near-term recommendations from the 2017 um, study to create that continuous bicycle facility now from Sunset Lake Road to um, High Street. And um, this is just depicting the um, recommended improvements from the study. Um, it is also recommended to design and install the proposed recommendations at the intersection of High Street and Green Street. Um, and those are shown um, on the bottom figure. Okay, um, and then as recommended in the Brattleboro downtown plan, um, as part of the short-term improvements, it is recommended to convert Flat Street to one way westbound between Elm Street and Main Street. Um, and, re, and possibly restripe the roadway to provide two-way bike lanes. Um, this is just a simple depiction of what it could possibly look like with a uh, westbound bike lane and then a contraflow eastbound bike lane. Um, and this is just showing maintaining parking on both sides. 
The traffic levels on Flat Street are extremely low, which offers the opportunity to dedicate more of the roadway to bicyclists. This is, um, yeah, and so then the conversion to one way westbound would also simplify the movements at the intersection of Main Street and Flat Street, which could help improve the circulation down at Main Street as well. It is also recommended to install shared lane markings or sharrows on Frost Street, Church Street, Elliott Street, and Elm Street to connect the sharrows on the existing sharrows on William Street and the these proposed bike lanes on Frost Street to Main Street. So these are shown in the blue um, dashes throughout the downtown area. Um, and I just want to reiterate again that we know that sharrows are not a dedicated bicycle facility. However, they can be a positive and affordable solution when designed correctly. All these downtown streets um, that I just named are relatively low speed and low volume roadways. So the sharrows will help to communicate to motorists that bicyclists will be using these streets and reinforce that drivers should adjust their behavior to share the road with bicyclists. Um, the sharrows will also indicate the lane positioning that bicyclists should assume when riding in the road. Okay, similarly, given the constraints on Main Street with, within downtown, we heard from you guys in the last presentation that you would uh, prefer to have Sharrows um, than to have an alternate route um, through downtown. So we recommend installing Sharrows on Main Street between High Street and Canal Street and also recommend installing bike boxes at the signalized, signalized intersections on Main Street. Um, and this is just a depiction of what um, a bike box and Sharrows could uh, look like at the intersection of Main Street and Elliott Street. Um, bike boxes are um, a little different, but they are, they are a designated area at the head of an approach at a signalized intersection that provide bicyclists with a safe and visible way to get ahead of queuing traffic um, when this traffic signal is red. So they also help to position bicyclists for left turn movements by getting in front of uh, the queued vehicles. And then they also help um, to prevent right hook conflicts um, with turning vehicles by, by also placing bicyclists in front of the queuing vehicles. Um, pedestrians can also benefit from bike boxes because they move the vehicular stop bars further from the intersection and further from the crosswalk. Um, on South Main Street as part of, part of the short-term improvements, it is recommended to convert the on-street part the on-street parking and the um, wide shoulders into bike lanes, um, creating a continuous bicycle facility from Canal Street to Fairground Road. And this is a depiction of um, what it could look like. This is at Oak Grove Ave and South Main Street. Okay, and finally, as part of the short-term improvements, it is recommended to install intersection enhancements at Western Avenue at William Street, William Street at Elliott Street and Frost Street, Frost Street at Elm Street and Church Street at Elliott Street. These intersections are, are all unsignalized intersections that could use simple signing and striping enhancements to reduce confusion um, and help reduce travel speeds and improve visibility and circulation for vehicles, pedestrians and bicyclists. The Envision Long-Term Bicycle Network is the second step in the creation of a safe, comfortable, and connected bicycle network for Brattleboro. The proposed facilities will require a lot more planning and design and funding, um, so therefore they have not been determined yet. However, um, they will include continuous bicycle and pedestrian facilities on Putney Road and Canal Street, continuous bike facilities on Maple Street and Fairground Road, a Woonerf on Bridge Street and intersection improvements on Maple Street at Fairview Street and um, along uh, Canal Street. So um, Emily, hopefully can I, you can, can I interrupt for a second. Sure. S sorry, just um, I think we have a picture, an image of the Woonerf, but people might not be familiar with that term. Um, yeah, I was going to explain it um, in the pedestrian section, but um a wooner is um 
It is a shared street. A shared street um, that it's a Dutch concept. Um, so it gives um, the opportunity to reclaim the roadway for bicycles and pedestrians. Um, there are no sidewalks, curbs, or lane markings. Everyone just shares the street um, evenly and it um, forces cars to drive slower, creating a more public space. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's usually designated with different pave, paving material so that you feel like you're not entering a street, but you're entering more of like a plaza. Great, thank you. Emily, we have some questions that have appeared, appeared in the chat and um, a hand raised. Do you want to go through the long term or do we want to take some of these questions now? We can take the questions. Okay. Um, let me go through the chat. First, so um, Tony asked, how much was the road repaving on South Main compared to building the sidewalk? And um, I, I don't know that, Tony. I can get back to you on that one. Um, the second question is, could the downtown lights also have a bike light to allow bikes in bike boxes additional time to move through the intersection without cars? That could be something that um, we incorporate um, where the bicyclists get um, a green light a little bit before the vehicle so that they have time to maneuver through the intersection before the vehicles go. So that's something that we could add. Of course, it would add additional cost um, to the improvement. So maybe that would be more in a longer term solution. Um, I have a similar question. Should I go to the microphone? Sure. Um, that microphone won't pick you up. You might want okay. to come a little bit closer. Um, and if, could you just let us know who you are? Oh, so I'm Viv Woodland. Uh, I, I'm wondering about, I've seen in other um, cities where there's a marking on the at the intersection for a bicyclist to sit so that the light knows that they are there. Um, so that, uh, you know, currently our lights are motion detected for vehicles. And I don't know if a bike in a bike box is going to trigger the light change. Yeah, that would have to, those signals would have to be probably updated for, for it to change with, with a bicyclist. It also, um, I don't know enough about the signals in downtown yet to know if they're all actuated um, or not. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that. We can look into how they're signalized um, as well. Um, let's, Zeke had a hand raised on Zoom. Let's take Zeke's question and then we'll go back to some of the chat questions. Zeke, are you able to unmute? Hi, yourself? I unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So I'm, I feel like I'm coming a bit late to this process um, later than I ideally would like to. Um, and I haven't obviously heard everything um, that you have to say yet. And I did miss, I heard about the last meeting, but I believe it, I heard about it right after it happened. And I was I did. I have not seen the recording of it. Um, although, you know, that's something I guess I could have looked into. I just found out today it had the recording. But I'm very curious about in something that's kind of outside of the realm of everything you've mentioned, which is, has any thought been put into pedestrian safety on Putty Road? Because that's the neighborhood I live in, and it seems like it's been kind of neglected or left out of this discussion and this planning. Um, Great River Terrace, where I live, has 22 separate apartments that is mostly disabled people. A lot of us do not have vehicles. Some of us have bikes. Many of us are pedestrians. Many of us have pets. This is an area where, I mean, for the longest time, there was one crossroad on the entirety of Putney Road 
right, at the roundabout. And they recently put in a crosswalk at Hannaford, which it's about time because it's, to me, kind of ridiculous to not have a crosswalk between um, the Brattleboro Commons area and the roundabout when there are so many situations like it's a it was treacherous for the longest time just crossing between like Hannaford and the dollar store if you had there this is a very it's a residential neighborhood also cars fly through here like it's not a residential neighborhood you know they're just like thinking of it as a community as a commuter you know throughway and the people who live there are invisible but in addition to the 22 apartments with you know, over 22 people living in them here. We have apartments across the street where people live. A lot of them are bikers and pedestrians. We have apartments, we have people living in these hotels who often have to are, it's a, just a very heavy pedestrian heavy area. And I'm a little disappointed that it seems like in all your consideration of making Brattleboro better for pedestrians and bikes that Punny Road doesn't even seem to have entered into the discussion or maybe it has and I've missed it so feel free to respond to that because I'm I'm going to wrap up my comment but um, I do wish I'd come into here earlier in the process because I'm thinking that maybe it was just a negligence of thinking just like people not thinking about the hundreds of people who live in these areas either you know in rent it renters or people who live in the hotels um the it, it's just uh, it's not a safe there's there are sidewalks on just part of the road in this and i would i think that it would be it's definitely needed to have another crosswalk in this area i think um the right around agway would be a really great place for a crosswalk or or the road before that and at the very least we deserve some signage like a put like a sign just to tell people to look out for pedestrians it's also a very unsafe place for animals like i've seen so many so much so many road killed animals over the past few years in this part of town, you know, luckily I haven't, I know I have a neighbor whose cat was killed out here. I, I've witnessed other large animals, not pets being killed here. So it's, to me, it's just a matter of time before a person gets killed and badly injured or badly injured or somebody else's pet, God forbid, runs in the road and gets, killed so that's we my comment appreciate the comments i sue do you want to start here or do you do you want us to i i was just going to say that we did have an extensive discussion at the last um meeting about putney road because the state vtrans is going to be doing some really um far-reaching changes um over the next couple of years um if i i don't know if if it Makes sense to to go back to that other presentation. Maybe we could do that at the end if if there's time. We could we could show you that. Um, I think Holly. What I would say is the comments that we received um, though are pertaining to north of the roundabout. So thank you very much for them. Um, it is it is true there are a lot of people living in that and and walking on that section of Putney Road. A lot of wildlife and pets and as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a very, like not only are there tons of people living in this area just north of the roundabout, but a much higher percentage of them literally have to walk everywhere and don't have cars. So it just, I'm wondering, you know, is it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely one of one of the things I mean, I think that that we need to include something in our report. Um, this is it, it is state owned road and the way that we've um, had sidewalks built there in the past is when private development is happening. So the town doesn't typically um, invest our own money into building sidewalks or even doing crosswalks on state owned road. Uh, we do 
often use some political pressure. So Hannaford's is also that state owned road, but we were able to um, successfully lobby for them to do something before uh, they undertake the big, bigger Putney Road plan, which does not go up to Great River Terrace. It ends at the roundabout. So I think that, you know, this this project definitely needs to reflect the land use changes and, and the number of people that are living north of the roundabout in response to that. And we're going to need to work with the state to make um, that happen. So it's what I'm hearing is that maybe I should also reach out and try to contact people at the state level about this road, but you also are, would be willing to put some clout and be in into making this a safer area for people walking and their pets. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's a couple of places within the town that we discuss it. Um, but but yeah, I think I think it's an area that we do need to look at. Um, and have conversations with the state. There are lots of, there's lots of federal money out there right now. So, you know, maybe there's some resources to, it might take some time, but, um, you know, getting a crosswalk um, or, or something. Yeah, at the very least, I feel like a sign that cautions drivers to watch for pedestrians, probably the expense would be well worth it. And even if they have like, a design on an overall plan for the next couple of years, I don't see any reason to delay putting in at least at the very least just a sign. I don't know, maybe maybe a, co a crosswalk would be not much more expensive. I kind of missed the financial part, but. Um. No, definitely appreciate your comments and we will um, make sure that that gets documented here um, so that we can you know, begin talking to the state and see see what we can do to make safety improvements there. Okay, and I've been meaning to reach out to my local rep, Tristan Tolino, because I've never met him and I'm not sure if he's aware of the um, pedestrian safety issues we have and biker safety we have in this area or not. Um, well, I know at least one of our representatives is on this meeting, so I'm sure she's listening in and yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, Kristen's the one for the our district, but I've never seen any, never met him or I may, might have once, but I've, he's never done any outreach to this area as far as I know. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna move on. We've got a bunch of other questions, but but thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, we're gonna let Molly um, respond. She is a representative and I see she has her hand raised and then we'll go back to the questions. Okay. Oh. Hi, sorry, I'm in the midst of, uh, we had a water problem in our house and there's loud fans are, Hi, Molly. are driving me crazy. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I, and I just heard a bit of what the, the previous person said, and it's a very complex issue. I have been writing to VTrans. I'm on the Transportation Committee in the House, so even though I'm not the official representative for that district, um, I have been sort of writing VTrans about that, and we did advocate for the um, crosswalk at Hannaford's and for the the, the um, flashing light by the uh, NECA, and um, I recently wrote to them and trying to see if we could even get just some some sidewalk uh, right there by the marina because it it narrows so much. And the response has always been, well, we're we're working on the road. We're going to have a whole new plan for the road with sidewalks, et cetera. That is true, but they're still working on right of way issues, which is taking a very long time. And uh, I I don't know, I think that's something, you know, Sue, maybe um, we can talk about this at another time, but but how to see if we can sort of even put a little bit more pressure on VTrans to try to get some kind of a sense of, of how to make this safer. And I, I really appreciate the comments of the person um, who just spoke and um, maybe we can get some uh, contact information for, for them. Yeah. Thank you, Molly. 
Um, Zeke, if you're if you want to uh, drop in the chat some contact information, um, you can send it to me privately at Sue Fillion, or you can just put it out there, and uh, we'll make sure to follow up with you as well. Um, so the next question, Andy Davis asked, what thinking has gone into the danger of drivers in parked cars opening their doors into bicycle lanes? I avoid congested roads with parked cars such as Main Street at all costs. Painted lines in general provide little security from distracted drivers. Um, Holly or Emily, do you want to speak to that one, please? Sure. Um, the dangers of distracted drivers opening doors. I think I've, getting doored. Yeah, getting doored. I, I've been doored, so I think about this all the time, actually. I have a scar to prove it. Um, we, yeah, I mean, some of what is proposed would, would calm the traffic. So that's, um, you know, if we, if we are ever narrowing travel lanes to make room for bikes, that has the added, added benefit of, uh, of calming the traffic, of slowing the traffic. Um, that that's one sort of partial solution. Um, I I don't know that there's um, a lot other than enforcement that uh, really has an impact on distracted driving. Um, tragically, um, but Emily, maybe you you could add some more to that. Yeah, yeah. So dooring is always um, something that we think about with um, congested areas and bike lanes and um, and unfortunately without additional width to provide buffers between um, travel lanes and park cars, um, the bike lane ends up fitting in between um, and um, in particularly to Main Street, at least with the Sharrows, they will they will be placed in the center of the road um, to try and encourage um, bicyclists to feel comfortable to take take the lane um, where um, you know a potential conflict may exist, and um, the Sharrows will also just help to reinforce to all drivers um, that, you know, bicyclists are allowed to use the travel lane and that they will be here. So um, it's kind of, yeah, uh, with with using the existing width, um, we're doing the best we can and providing the best facilities, but it, they're definitely not the most optimum facilities and, and um, you know, the, the lowest stress facilities, unfortunately. So where, where there's enough sidewalk width you know, m making it possible to, for bicyclists and pedestrians, at least um, put potentially to use the same sidewalk. Um, that's, that's one, that's another solution. You would have to have, you know, the right dimensions to be able to do that. But also the thinking that in general about putting bike lane on the other side of the parked cars um, is that most people drive alone. So most people are, most people in cars are getting out of the, the sidewalk side of the car um, and not opening the passenger side door into traffic. So um, that's, that's the thinking. I, I was actually hit by someone who was opening a passenger side door. So I, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> Some of it, it's always, um, you know, unfortunately, it's the way our roads and our infrastructure is now, it's always on you as the more vulnerable user of the road to be to be ever vigilant and to always assume that something is going to spring up in front of you or, or happen unexpectedly because you, you are the most um, in danger. Um. Tony has a question. What is the connection between the West River Trail and Route 30? Um, we'll get to that as soon as we present the long-term bike facilities, but I'll just, as a preview, there is no set um, location right now. That would be a longer term kind of study uh, that would need to take place. Um, can you repeat the last piece? The shared road is, I'm not sure I'm understanding. That oh, the wound is it describing the wounder? Maybe oh, the wounder. Okay. 
Yes, so that would be Bridge Street. So uh, that is the road that goes from Main Street down to the current Hinsdale Bridges. So the idea, and we'll we'll show a graphic, I think, in this in this presentation. The idea is once the um, once there's considerably less traffic on Bridge Street, then we can can change the configuration. We're going to still need vehicular access to the businesses um, and the train station, but that that could could change and and be more of a shared road. Um, there was a question about thinking of alternate um, routes for bicycles. For example, North Street to Wontasticate Drive is a much better choice than Putney Road between the Common and the Veterans Bridge. Um, could we have a meeting of cyclists uh, to share alternative lower traffic routes that connect our town in a much safer way. I drive all over Brattleboro and rarely drive on much of the heavier traveled roads. Separate is safer when it comes to bikes and cars. Um, that's a that's a good idea. Um, Holly had shared with me some bicycle routes that I think the town of Har West Hartford, Connecticut had done and kind of published. So. I think, you know, that'd be separate from this project, but um, definitely, you know, we, there could be some maps created, even maybe some signage. So I think that that is something to be um, considered. Um, and the longer term um, facilities that we're showing, you know, in the dotted, in the circle dots, um, like Canal Street and Putney Road, those would require, um, you know, their own study to determine what's feasible um, and what's the best solution. So there's an opportunity there to give feedback as well in the future for those specific routes. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll, it's, there's a lot of new messages going up. Maybe um, we'll take a break from responding to those and um, let Emily present on kind of the longer term bicycle facilities because we still have pedestrian uh, to go through as well. Sure, yeah. I think I already um, kind of touched upon the long term, but basically um, they will require, oops, sorry. They will require, um, you know, more planning and more study and design. So we're not sure exactly what facilities um, are the most feasible, but um, we are showing, you know, connections on Putney Road, Maple Street, Canal Street, and Fairground Road, just to, to show that connected network of facilities. Um, and then some intersection improvements at Maple Street and Fairview Street, and then along Canal Street to really improve um, conditions for bicyclists and pedestrians and slow vehicular traffic down. Um, so I will move along to pedestrian facilities. Does that make sense or do you yeah, want to keep? Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, today, Brattleboro does have a considerably robust pedestrian network. However, there are some deficiencies as we talked a lot about in the previous meeting. Um, the key to improving walking conditions in Brattleboro is by enhancing the pedestrian network and filling in um, those gaps. The recommended pedestrian facilities that we are going to run through in these next slides include crosswalk enhancements, intersection safety improvements, and new sidewalk installments that were prioritized based on the public comments and their safety benefits. Um, so this is the existing, um, these are the existing pedestrian facilities in Brattleboro. Um, the light orange are the sidewalks, and then we're showing that mixed use um, multi-use path again as well. Um, there are some planned upcoming pedestrian improvements to help the walking conditions in Brattleboro. These include the sidewalk improvements on Western Avenue, Green Street, and Clark Avenue. Um, and then again, with the Putney Road improvements, sidewalks will be provided from Chesterfield Road to the West River. Um, and with the new bridge, a sidewalk will be provided on Vernon Street from the new bridge to Morningside Commons. Oh, I am a little ahead of myself. So here we go. These are the bicycle and pedestrian improvements. Um, okay, so then for short-term facilities, um, they include mostly intersection and crosswalk enhancements. Um, pedestrians are um, among the most vulnerable road users, especially at uncontrolled locations, using traffic calming devices, 
as well as other safety countermeasures that aim at changing the behavior of both pedestrians and motorists um, and increase the visibility and accessibility at pedestrian crossings um, and intersections can help encourage proper pedestrian use, um, lower vehicle speeds, and increase vehicle compliance. So um, in that 2017 study that we talked about along Western Avenue, they also included crosswalk improvements. Um, so as part of the short-term improvements, it is recommended to install um, visibility enhancements at the crosswalks at Brookside Drive, George F. Miller Drive, and um, right near the post office. Um, these, these visibility enhancements um, can include decorative or textured crosswalks, advanced markings and signage, curb extensions, flush pedestrian refuge islands, lighting, um, RFBs, um, some, you know, some pretty inexpensive um, treatments that can really help to uh, slow vehicles and um, increase visibility of pedestrians. Um, and then I also just want to note that the proposed recommendations at the intersection of High Street and Green Street also include pedestrian enhancements, um, including bump outs and medians, um, and then, um, you know, changing the orientation of the intersection to really slow vehicles as they turn from High Street to Green Street. Um, and then, from the room, sure. Emily. Yeah. What's a curb extension? Sure, so curb extension, um, I'll go back to the, um, so this is an example of one. If you can see my mouse, it's right here. So it bumps the um, pedestrian realm from the, from the edge of the roadway out um, so that it um, makes vehicles, you know, for this, in this case, it has vehicles turning um, more, which will slow them down, but it also puts pedestrians closer to the roadway, um, which increases the visibility um, of the pedestrian to the motorist. And then it also shortens the crossing distance. Um, so it's a great tool to both slow vehicles and um, improve the visibility um, and the um, walkability for pedestrians. So you often see them at at, um, cor at intersections on the corners at uh, where like parked cars are so that it extends past the parked car. So pedestrians are placed um, in an, a more visible area. That looks fantastic as a pedestrian. And I particularly like that location that you're showing at Green Street because I worry about as a bicyclist, I worry about um, cars turning right onto Green Street and cutting me off if I'm going straight on High Street. But these kind of things where the sidewalk is wider, particularly downtown, I experience as a bicyclist, there is absolutely no shoulder. And so it becomes a pinch point on a bicycle. Um, so I would just recommend watching that and maintaining some sort of shoulder for bicyclists while you're improving things for pedestrians. I am no, both. I, I actually, in my job, I cross the street right here where you're showing, and I'm very excited about that crosswalk, my, Mark. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to? I have a oh, question. We have a question here. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a biker and uh, pedestrian as well, um, and I do have a car. Um, and I, I just think about the winter time, you know, when uh, uh, we get snow and so on and so forth. And most people don't really plow their sidewalks, and just how tre how treacherous it is, it is for pedestrians in the winter time, uh, whether it be kids going to school or you know just just people who uh, walk to get where they're going um where they often go, go out in the road so i don't know if that there's that's been brought up but it seems to me that's something that would be good to be addressed because it's, it's a big portion of the year yeah thank you um, i think that is something that's going to have to be um definitely you know considered with these facilities making sure that they're maintained in the winter 
as you know, in Brattleboro, there's only a certain number of sidewalks that are plowed in the winter and, you know, it can take a couple of days um, to get them plowed. So yeah, it's definitely something we'll need to be considering. Mm -hmm. Keeping bike lanes clear when we put them in. And I don't know if, if it would be at all an option, but I, realistic and so on but you know that 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 people be required to you know if they own the, mm -hmm. the house adjacent that they that they know, do the sidewalk but you know it's i have to say uh it that seems like a lot downtown. of people don't don't what's that that is the case downtown mm -hmm. but they're required that people the, the business owners right mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a pretty common thing throughout new england where i grew up I think we had 24 to 48 hours to clear the sidewalk in mm -hmm. front of our house houses. Um, culturally, that's not been the practice here in Brattleboro, but you know, it certainly has. Some people have thrown it out there, like you know, what? Why don't we do that if we want better sidewalk conditions? So, I think that's, you know, just a cultural shift that the community would need to make. Um, Emily, do you want me, is this a good stopping point? We can go back to the chat or do you want to keep going? We can go back. We can, sure. Let's, um, let me pull up the chat comments. Um, there was a question about, is there a reason that Main Street couldn't be converted to a Wooner as a way to signal the very shared function of downtown and maybe a way to encourage cars and trucks to use different roads? Um, I mean, that, that would be a conversation with the state. Um, it is state route. Um, it's town maintained, but we really can't do much, uh, without their consent. So I, yeah, just, I don't have a good sense. Um, I do think, uh, the local roads can't necessarily handle the truck traffic. I mean, it would be, um, yeah, I, I think we just have to kind of have that conversation with VTrans. Um, let's see. Uh, I was wondering about how much the condition of the road services talked about and recommendations include making a bike friendly road service, a uh, surface, which is different than what is adequate for cars. Um, Emily or Holly, can you address road surface for bicyclists? It, it isn't something we've specifically um, looked at in this in this study. Um, we were well. Will <laughs> I don't want to give it away. Um, we we have a nice reveal um, that um, is coming up um, where we're going to talk about road maintenance projects. Um, and how we can tie into them and make sure that everything happens at once to be most cost effective. Um, I, maybe I should leave it at that and tell you that we're, we're going to say more about um, road resurfacing um, very shortly. The, the, but to your point, I mean, um, it really is an issue. And we've thought about it a little bit more in the context of sidewalks because there is data that shows what condition the sidewalks of Brattleboro are in. So, you know, one way that we could create maybe one big project that would be worthy of either, you know, um, a large grant or potentially bonding would be to take all of the segments of sidewalk that are in poor condition and try to repair them all in the same, you know, with the same grant funding. Um, so that's something that we we do know, and it's a little bit easier to to characterize and to and to deal with because it's it's sort of a more known entity. There's there's so many more miles of roads than there are of sidewalks. Um, but once we establish specific routes, you know, um, even if we did a sort of um, you know j just a little signed route through town that. Um, you know, you could you could have it measured, and and you could have people use it for recreation, and they know it's a three mile loop, and um, you know you could specify one with very few hills, maybe, <laughs> um, and uh, you know 
once you did that, you could, if you're focused on one specific route, it would be easier to sort of address the road surface issues. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think we can um, move on with the presentation. Okay. Sure. Um, and then, so um, the other short-term pedestrian improvement um, includes uh, installing the missing sidewalk um, on Fairground Road and Atwood Street um, to connect to the Brattleboro, excuse me, Brattleboro Union High School. Uh, today, there's no sidewalk on Atwood Street between Fairground Road and the high school, and some sidewalk is missing on portions of Fairground Road. So um, making those um, missing connections is also part of the short-term improvements. Um, and then for the Long-term improvements, um, these also will require more planning, design, and more funding, um, but um, they include sidewalk on Belmont Avenue, um, we're missing around the bend, um, and um, on Cedar Street, the sidewalk stops at Laurel Street, so as part of the long-term improvements, um, it is recommended to install the sidewalk from Laurel Street to Linden Street. And then um, there's currently no sidewalk on Black Mountain Road. So um, it is also recommended to install sidewalk from Putney Road to Buttonwood Hill Road on uh, Black Mountain Road. And then um, we discussed it a little bit earlier, but um, as, it, as recommended in the Brattleboro downtown plan um, and as part of the long-term improvements, it is recommended to redesign Bridge Street as a, as a wooner when the new bridge is built. Um, with the new bridge, Bridge Street will become a lower traffic um, and dead end street, essentially. Um, so it creates the opportunity for pedestrians and bicyclists to reclaim it. Um, and as we kind of described earlier, it is a Dutch concept where the street is shared by pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, um, other community activities. Um, and there are usually no sidewalks, curbs, or lane markings. Um, it is usually designated with a different type of texture or pavement um, to be more like a, um, like a pedestrian pathway or something like that, um, forcing cars to slow down um, and inviting more people to use the public space. And so that is, that's it for the, the long, the long-term pedestrian improvements. So we can take more comments or questions um, if you have them. Um, I have a question. Yeah, we've got one from the room here. Okay. Hi, uh, I, now I'm not sure in, if in the long-term or short-term uh, solutions there was, uh, you, ha you had said Canal Street, but I was wondering how far up, um, because I feel concerned that no safe routes are going to the schools. So for many years, we were biking our boys over to academy school through that bottleneck on, um, like West the, Brattleboro, the bridge, the, Western the bridge. Avenue. Western Avenue, Western yeah. Avenue yeah, going into narrow West, super Canada. narrow where there's yeah. barely a sidewalk and the the bridge is barely just sort of ends with some um, cement blockers. Mm -hmm. It's not even a proper railing and it's school children. Uh, I don't know how big Academy School is, but as a big biker, I, I feel like um, it needs to start with the school children having other bike awareness and, uh, and and feeling like encouraged to bike to school. So with the roads being so dangerous, there's not even as a parent, I don't even want to encourage them to ride to school, but my boys have been riding to school. And for two years, they rode up to Hilltop. So part of Guilford Extension, it's a little treacherous right after Memorial Park. Suddenly the bike lane ends and the shoulder disappears and the dirt goes right into the lane. Um, so it gets suddenly super narrow there. 
Same with the road that goes up to Austin School or former Austin School. Uh, we've almost been run over by a fire truck there. We've almost been run off, I mean, not run over, but run off the road. Super dangerous. And that's another really nice route going over to the high school. So, but if it goes up, up along Canal Street, is it going all the way up to that traffic light by Market 32? That was my original question. Yeah, so... Um... A couple of things there. I'll, I'll start with Canal Street and then just point out a couple of other things. So Canal Street, you know, boy, we, we rode that at the start of this project and that felt the most unsafe to me <laughs> riding in town because there's so much going on. There's so many intersection streets and there's so many um, parked cars on the road and it just made me really nervous. I'm not not a bicycle commuter, but I do ride a bicycle around. Um, so when we think of Canal Street, we there's so many intersections there that are unsafe. I see that as a big corridor study where maybe we pursue either state or federal funds. We'll get to that. And we really look at the bicycle and pedestrian improvements. And it would be at least all the way up to fairgrounds. So the road to the high school, maybe it goes further. I know that there, you know, there's definitely businesses past exit one. Uh, so Bicycle lanes, you know, would be useful up there, I think, I, you know, get that state route at that point. So, um, but, you know, there's definitely destinations, whether it's Algiers Village, whether it's Commonwealth Dairy or the industrial park or the people that live there. So, but at least for a quarter study where we'd be looking at intersection and sidewalks and bicycle lanes, it would be um, the intersection of Main Street all the way to Fairground. Mm -hmm. um, one comment I just wanted to make about that bridge on Western Avenue that you talked about that is um, slated to be replaced. I think it's 2025, I think. So it's in design now. There is going to be wide sidewalks and um, a 10 foot shoulder on each side. So that it will be much improved for both pedestrians and bicyclists on that bridge. That is a state project as well. Um, and then Maple, in this plan, you know, we've definitely covered to the public schools. Um, it does not include any recommendations for Old Guilford or Guilford Street to get up to Hilltop. Um, but definitely Maple Street is kind of wide. Um, there seems to be room for um, bicycle lanes. That probably has to be studied a little bit further. So that is one of the recommendations, though, in this plan. Um, Does Maple Street go all the way from Canal, all the way over down, like to, to where it turns off to the park? Yes. Is that oh, all Maple? That's all Maple. Ah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that would be key. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So we tried to create the network where um, no facilities would just stop um, in the middle of a roadway and not, not provide um, a connection to another facility. So that was in the hopes of creating the network was to to provide um, connections to important destinations, but also provide connections to other bicycle facilities, um, creating you know, a web of, of possibilities for, for people to bike to and from. I have another question. Yeah. So, so what's uh, the timeline for the, um, the, uh, the short-term improvements that, you, that you're talking about? Like when do you think it would be done by? Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, maybe that's a good um, segue into kind of the implementation um, and some of the sources. I mean, if you go back to the start of it where we talked about the funding that the town is currently setting aside, it's not adequate to even cover all of those um, necessarily. So uh, it's hard to put a hard and fast state on it, but... I'll let Emily and Holly kind of speak to some of the things I think that ways that they're thinking the town should be looking at it. Sure, yeah. So um, the final re report will include a detailed implementation plan for all the short term and long term bicycle and pedestrian recommendations. Um, and the plan will include a list of target projects like um, the list that's shown here um, that will allow everyone to understand both the scope and the scale of what is needed for the plan to be put to pavement. Um, and where possible, the implementation plan will highlight how the proposed 
bicycle and pedestrian facilities can be incorporated into some of the existing town plans um, and budgets. So um, for example, the two items highlighted in orange, those um, design plans are likely already starting soon. So that's um, a good start. And then um, one easy step um, is the integration of the plan into the town's resurfacing program. Um, so annually or even more frequently, um, the town could coordinate um, the recommended bicycle and pedestrian enhancements with their annual paving activities. Um, so for example, um, we found out that Flat Street, Frost Street, and Elm Street are likely going to be repaved next season, ideally. Um, so when they are repaved, uh, they will have to be restriped. And so if, um, you know, design plans are already in place, um, they can be restriped to include the um, short-term improvements like the Sharrows, um, the bike lanes, and um, all the intersection improvements. Um, with minimal increased cost to what the repaving would already be. Um, so that would be a big, a big um, help in, in getting the short-term improvements um, installed. Yeah, and, then, and you know, another factor is, is, is it state road or is it, um, you know, is it town road? So something like, Flat Street is, you know, town maintained, so it's a look could be easier for us permitting wise to make some changes. Um, you know, obviously there's outreach that we would need to do with businesses, especially if it became one way, um, and the bus and and all those kind of things. Um, but if you're talking about Western Avenue and and uh, they refer to the this 2017 plan like that needs to be reviewed by the state we need to get their buy-in because it is a town road a state road even though it's maintained by the town so there's just it depends on the segment um something like south main street maybe we need to change some ordinances where it where that currently allows on-street parking maybe we would need to lose some on-street parking to do uh bicycle lanes but that could be an easier implementation because we don't it is town town owned and town maintained. Um, yeah, so we have to kind of work out the details of that still in the implementation plan. Right. Where will the bike lanes be? Like I'm thinking about uh, Western Avenue and that so from like the Crow Lot and out out to the interstate, mm -hmm. you've got this. You've got the sidewalk and then you've got the the parking lane. So where, where the biking lane? Where's the biking lane going to go? Yeah. So for that specific project, actually, um, we're hoping to see that segment done in the spring. The town received a grant for that, and so we need to work on some final design. But that that was we did a scoping study back in sure. 2021. Um, the idea there is um, we will lose parking on one side of the street, but it's going to kind of alternate throughout the road segment segment. So there'll be um, alternating bike lanes on each side of the road. Sometimes you'll have some parking on one side and then it's going to kind of jog just ever so slightly. And then you'll lose, you know, you'll lose parking on one side for a stretch. So um, we're working with public works to kind of design that and we'll bring that to the public. And then uh, we have the funding to mm -hmm. implement that um, in the spring as long as soon as it's fully designed and then signed off on by uh, the state. Mm -hmm. And um, a, bunch, a bunch of questions. So uh, I think it was, um, Emily, I think you mentioned something about uh, uh, one thing that's planned in the works is there'll be a, a side sidewalk that's widened so that you know, it'll be actually for pedestrians and for bicyclists, there'll be a mm -hmm. bike lane. What, where would that be? That particular design is um, the intersection of Green Street and High Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and we have lots of wide intersections. I mean, I think of Canal Street. In no, I'm actually, I'm, what I'm talking about is, and maybe I misunderstood, but I thought that there was talk about at some point somewhere in town where the, the sidewalk would be widened, so the sidewalk would be for pedestrians and for bicyclists, but there would be like a oh. A, a, 
a uh, shared yeah right yeah, exactly. is that the bridge street winner or um are you thinking of what of sorry go ahead no go ahead emily are you thinking of what we talked about last the last presentation or this one no i thought i heard something to that effect but maybe i misunderstood so i've, I've, I've seen that uh, elsewhere like in the burlington area for example they have some areas where this uh, um the sidewalk is is for both so that it was wide widened and it's accommodates pedestrians and bicyclists and yeah. there's sort of like a bike lane and a pedestrian lane yeah mm -hmm. we don't have that um proposed right now there are segments of the putney road plan mm -hmm. which we could get into at another point mm -hmm. um where they they want to install roundabouts and in the roundabout area it would become a wider shared use path so there'd be segments where there's bike lane in the road and a separate sidewalk and then there'd be segments where it kind of becomes a wider path and the bicyclists and the pedestrians um, yeah. are around it yeah. um we don't have any other proposals on the route routes to have it as a multi-use path mm -hmm. um i think that sometimes when there's so many driveways intersecting it, it doesn't necessarily serve, um, it, it's just more difficult. It might take more right of way. Yeah. There's a lot of crossings. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. which I wouldn't they, say we rule it out yeah. necessarily. Yeah. It might come in for their design work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are possibilities for, um, you know, the longer term improvements um, potentially on Canal Street or, or the section of Putney Road south of West River. Um, I assume those will be looked at when when those corridor studies um, take place. But yeah, they uh, we talked a little bit about it at the last meeting, but it can pose some safety risks for pedestrians, especially considering um, e-bikes and how fast they can go if they're using a shared facility. So there's some, some drawbacks to um, shared use paths as well. But um, definitely, definitely a possible possible facility for some of the roadways. I I can't tell if any other hands are raised or um, if we should just carry on. I think we have um, just a couple more slides. We have a couple of chat, and we could just. Uh, Dan asks, can you discuss the idea of making Flat Street one-way westbound and any other one-way conversions? Um, so the idea of making um, Flat Street one-way um, actually was discussed in the downtown plan that we have. I think at that point it was eastbound. I think because of um, it would be one-way westbound, because of the way that the bus functions. So coming in from Main Street and they're often exiting uh, via Elm Street. So that would be, that's kind of the idea of making it one way. It's, um, and then potentially you could use, lose the light, the traffic light at the intersection of Flat Street and Main Street. Again, this would have to be, you know, vetted a little bit further um, with VTrans, but, but, you know, it's certainly a low, vehicle trafficked road um and you know we, we could make it more uh bicyclists and pedestrian friendly or you know even have it have a little bit more kind of street activity um with the businesses or or that kind of thing it's it's a pretty wide road in in certain sections so so that that was the thinking there um, in terms of other one-way street conversions, um, this plan doesn't really envision that at this point. I don't know, if Holly or Emily, if you've given any thoughts of that. We did give some initial thought to almost like a one-way couplet um, with Frost Street being one direction. And um, one of the roadways, either north or south, to be the other direction. Um, but... I think I think for I mean Frost Street is a great um, a great first trial for sure. Um, if you add more one way streets, it can it can actually worsen um, the traffic conditions on Main Street because there will be vehicles circling more um, around the downtown area um, trying to get to their destination. So um, we looked at it a little bit, but then we we decided to. Um, to kind of use Frost Street as the initial example. 
Flat Street. Thank you. Yeah. Flat Street. Yeah. Sorry, Flat Street. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then there's a question. Curious if cyclists have said they would use Flat Street westbound. Seems very difficult for a cyclist westbound because it leaves one at a low elevation. Um, I think in terms of we were thinking it would be two way um, cyclist activity. It would just be one way vehicular. And yes, uh, the Dutch word Woonerf is residential area in translation. <laughs> Thank you for that, Andy. Well, um, I, I'm happy to, to just wrap up um, talking a little bit about funding. I think you have a good idea that it, from the discussion so far that, you know, there are a lot of complexities here. There's jurisdiction, you know, when VTRAN is you know, has has say over what happens to the road and, and they also have to um, comply with certain standards. Um, we have right of way issues, which um, apparently are holding up the, the Putney Road project um, or at least lengthening it, um, you know, before it can actually get started. Um, and And then there's the cost. So, Thankfully, at least there's some answers there, some, some good news. There is quite a lot of money available. Um, the Northern Borders Regional Commission funding, um, there's those projects um, are up to a million dollars in funding. And please, Brandy, uh, if you wanna um, join in or, or correct me, please do. Um, ARPA funds are for, for the um, the pandemic relief, and it's it's a very large pot of money. As some of it may already have been earmarked, or we may Brattleboro may still be deciding what to do with that money. I know there there are certainly some ideas out there already, um, but you know if if even a small portion of that could be set aside for um, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, it would still be more than you currently have. <laughs> um, the Better Connections grant is, the amount available depends on the project type. And if the project includes stormwater improvements, there's an additional $30,000 that could be made available for the project. Raise grants are, are federal grants that um, offer a million dollars minimum for capital projects no minimum for planning projects and a, a maximum of 25,000, 25, sorry, to 45 million, depending on the project and the funding type. And then VTRANS has these bike ped grants available. Um, a scoping grant would be 25 to $40,000. A small scale project is, is up to 75,000. And there's no stated maximum, at least for design and construction of projects. And then um, these mobility and, and transportation innovation grants are something that Go Vermont is, um, has put forth. So depending on the size and the project, you know, that funding pool might be available as well. And finally, bonding. Um, so if, if we could put together some concepts for projects that would be um, able to be bonded, Bur Burlington has used bonding to pay for some bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. So um, we're gonna make sure that uh, the DPW folks in Brattleboro and, and Burlington maybe have a chat about that. Um, and, you know, it's, it means that you get a good amount of money up front and, and you pay it off over 20 years. So um, I just put a few examples there of how much money you could get and what it would mean in annual repayments. Can I add in one thing on that, Holly? I think one, one way to think about it, um, most of these federal um, sources of money um, require a 20% match from the community. 
Um, typically, it's it's cash match. Um, so one way to think about it is if you did something like bonding, you would have a pool of local money that you could then use to match against some of these federal sources of money. So you could basically take one of, of your dollars and combine it with four dollars um, from, from, you know, in grant money. So it's a way to take your money and multiply it. Great point. Thank you. Yeah, that's really important. Thanks, Holly. We have a question in the room and then I've got two on the chat. So I was curious who is in charge of applying for all these funds. <laughs> so um, that happens to be typically the planning department applies for the funds. It could be public works, but we've kind of established a relationship where um, we are often applying. Um, we need approval from the select board to apply. And um, you know, sometimes it's a matter of capacity. Can we take on another grant? Um, you know, do we have the staffing? Does the finance department have the staffing? What are the requirements of the grant? So, and then do we have the match, um, you know, in the town? So, you know, it can be a process. Some of them have a lot of uh, requirements if it's, especially if it's federal money. Um, so we did, we have been successful um getting grants from V transfer scoping studies. Uh, we have a grant, a small scale grant to do the bike lane on Western Avenue between Green Street and Allerton. Um, and so that actually brings me to a question in the in the chat. But but yeah, essentially it's town staff um, that will pursue the grants um, with the approval of the select board to go ahead and apply. Um, there was a question about when will Western Avenue residents be able to see the plans for the spring of 2023 bike project. Um, so actually, we just got the grant agreement today. And so that means that it'll kind of trigger the work. I need to have a meeting with Public Works. Um, I would say within the next, uh, you know, we, we hope to have the design kind of complete. Um, in the next two months or so, maybe by the end of January, and then we, you know, we'll definitely have it out there, um, send notice to the residents that it'd be available to see. Um, and then we have another question. Is there a plan for a multi-use path across the top of the commons behind the gazebo? So it's not a project um, that was called out um, individually, there is discussions, there is a plan, at least a long-term plan to kind of uh, deal with the Putney Road area from the Veterans Bridge to Main Street. So that that could include a plan um, for such a path across, but there is nothing specific um, in the short-term um, projects for that. I don't know if you want to... Kevin, if you want to have a comment any more on that or um, uh, advocate yeah, sure. for that, no, that, that, that makes sense. And I think that was just something that a few of us um, in the Brattleboro Coalition for Active Transport group have, have thought of, and especially kind of, as you're saying, the, the connections to get around and the excitement on the uh, Route 30 bike path to get up to West River Park. That might be a nice connection going kind of around town but the road um, and kind of we'll use air quotes staying out of traffic's way um, there so everyone would feel safer using the commons in that way. That's a great and a really logical safe safe connection. Um, we we did look at that. Um, Emily, can you remind me what we uh, what we concluded about that? It's just um, maybe we, it didn't make the list. Yeah, and I know there is, a, it, it does get quite steep once you get to the Route 30 section. So trying to figure out what that access would look like could be a potential point of concern, but that would be a, a really nice loop that folks could take, especially if they felt safe biking or walking um, to, to do that. I, I think the problem was the on-road part of Putney Room. So, um, I mean, we, we did specify it as being an area in need of further study um, because of those complexities, but it, it's, it would be a really nice route into town. Absolutely, 100% agree. 
We can include it as part of the further study for the Putney Road because I agree it's a great connection. Yeah. Comment on that. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm, yes. I don't have my video on this thing, so I can't raise my hand and I can't find the hand symbol on the thing. So I just have to <laughs> no just speak up. That's <laughs> great. The common, not the commons. The commons is the newspaper, but I'm biased. Um, that idea across the common uh, it doesn't have to wait until that difficult Putney Road mess gets fixed because it could weave into uh, what Andy had talked about, alternative routes. Anybody coming up from Putney Road into town uh, and knows the Wantastiquit route knows that that's great. That Wantastiquit Road route ends off right at the top of the common and then that um then that potential paved path linking to route 30 or to downtown uh could be um could be really beneficial to what exists now because clearly the unfortunately the problem of putney road that area of putney road is i guess and i don't recall from the presentation it's probably a long-term project to try to figure out how to fix that for for us but um but kevin's idea of of uh, multi-use across the common uh, behind the gazebo fits into what exists now once we publicize a lot of good alternative routes one toxicate road being uh, one of the best ones Thanks, Barry. I think that that um, deserves looking at again, Andy, um, you know, kind of second that it said he uses the imaginary path across the top of the commons mm -hmm. quite a bit. Much better option, even with no actual paths, than competing with the cars on the courthouse racetrack. So, um, mm -hmm. Holly and Emily, maybe we can uh, chat about that and maybe move it into um, a short term um, and, and, you know, the sidewalk in that area is pretty lousy as well for parts of it around the commons. So having a multi-use path yeah. maybe could better both. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There are there any other questions or comments? Well, I just want to thank you for the good work that you're doing and moving in the right direction. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, used to live in Burlington. Uh, actually, was there in that area for many years. And, uh, um, you know, the, the quality of life has increased greatly in that area, really because of the changes they've made in terms of uh, pedestrian and bicyclist uh, routes and safety and so on. And so uh, anything in that direction is really good. And so I appreciate the work that you're doing to, to um, move in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. I can't tell you how many times we talk about the Church Street Mall in planning <laughs> in New England. It's, it's such a standout example of, of what's possible when you, um, you know, put your mind to it and your political will. Kevin, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, I did. I did one, one, one more thing that I was thinking of. Um, as far as share roads and, and educating folks, um, it would be my perception that not everyone knows what share roads mean. Um, so I would hope there could be some educational campaign or something that would go along with that. Um, and then that kind of spurred me to think if, if this is if there are already signs in other communities um, about letting folks know that to that this Brattleboro is a bike friendly town, um, especially as they get off of um, onto or off of 91 and come into town to be knowing to be looking for for cyclists rather than happening upon them um, could be really helpful. You can apply for bicycle friendly community status. We, so. we are working on it. Uh, You're working on it. Okay. Yeah, we are working on it. We're not quite there yet. We're hoping this, this really helps us um, get that um, status and accreditation. But I think even, you know, as folks, especially on Western Ave, get on and off the road there, and knowing if they're coming into town like, hey, you know, bike friendly town or something like that to, 
to be on the road. I know I've driven in Madison, Wisconsin, and there are a lot of bikes there, and, and you know that you need to be aware. Um, so hopefully we can we can get to that kind of like, oh, there are just bikes everywhere kind of status because people are feeling safe and welcome to use the speed station. That's yeah. a good suggestion. Great points and, and great suggestion about the outreach about Sharos to education. Um, Tony, do you want to unmute? Yeah, um, so there's a couple of things. One, I, I, again, I'm really pleased. I didn't realize that you guys had done so much work um, and it's really good. So I really um, appreciate that the town is doing this and that you guys are, are doing such a good job. Um, there's a few things. One is, um, um, you know, one concern, like I've seen on Facebook a couple of times in different parts of the country, people really angry about bike um, infrastructure. Um, there's one recently where they're like, you know, they put up these cement blocks and they blocked downtown and it's a mess and these bike bikers are screwing everything up. Um, and, you know, just wondering about communication to make sure that we're working together rather than it's this, you know, antagonistic conflict between, you know, pedestrians, bikers, and, uh, and cars. Um, so one thing I was wondering about the um, um, flat street, is there, is, does that cause an issue in terms of traffic? Is, is that going to be something that people are like, oh, shit, I can't turn on to, uh, you know, Western Avenue from flat street anymore, I have to go up to Canal Street or something like that. Um, you know, Again, I'm just, I'm, you know, maybe it's not a problem, um, but I think it's important to sort of take into consideration sort of reactions. Um, and then a couple of other things are like Molly said something about the Putney Road coming down from, you know, from the north to the bridge. And I I'm do that almost every day and there's no shoulder. And I'm like, how do you build up? I mean, she said something about building up the you know, the, the side to make room for a bike path or something. Um, I assume that's a major expense and that, that's something that would be farther, you know, farther along in the future. Yeah, I can address um, well, both of them, but on the Putney Road, um, actually in that, in that segment of Putney Road, the state's plan is actually to acquire right away and probably do some blasting on the opposite side. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's just a massive project. It's not funded yet. They are working on right-of-way negotiations. Um, you know, we're probably looking at 2025, 2026, um, but it would be, um, you know, really, uh, you know, bicycle and pedestrian improvements all the way from the, the Veterans Bridge to the Exit 3 roundabout. Um, that would would be major change, major change to the roadway, including roundabouts and center median. Um, again, bicycle lanes, crosswalks, um, sidewalks. So uh, that's just one to be watching over the next couple of years. It is a state project, and it, like I said, it's not funded at this point. Um, in terms of communication, I think your point is well taken. You know, the idea of flat street is going to need to take a lot of conversation with the select board and probably be trans to and, um, you, you know, other users of the, that roadway, you know, those with dry, that parking lots on it, like the latches, um, you know, the other residences there, the transportation center, the bus, all of that. So I think your, your point about communication is well taken and as is Kevin's about sharrows and education. Um, so that was, that would be something that we would definitely need to work on as well. Um, we have some awesome. comments here about Maple Street um, and, you know, the idea of proposed housing development at Austin campus and speed concerns on the roadway. Um, and is there, um, you know, neighbors appreciating some traffic calming? Um, we have, so the town has a traffic safety committee. And if you aren't aware of it, if you have some safety concerns, there is a form on the town website. We have started receiving some about Maple Street and the visibility at some intersections. Um, so um, we are constantly doing speed counts, not always on Maple Street. They kind of um, 
you know, they kind of rotate around town, but um, certainly we want to hear about the concerns um, and we will you know, take them up as we get them. Um, I think something like bicycle lanes and encouraging, um, you know, more, uh, you know, narrowing down the travel, the vehicular travel lanes um, could help with speed. And in terms of any development at the Austin campus um, or the Winston Party campus, that would definitely require some traffic studies um, as that comes along. But I think, you know, that will be incremental over time. And we would definitely be looking at that intersection and the amount of traffic that would be generated there. And then we have a question of what are the next steps for us advocates to get these plans and ideas closer to implementation and reality? Um, so I think our, our next step is, you know, this, this plan is going to be drafted. Um, we will present it to the select board. I think, um, you know, some of it is probably a, a lot of the suggestions in here are going to take select board support. So I think if our um, so people that live in town or even work in town, you know, can can help advocate that way. Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of organizations in town. There's Brattleboro Coalition for Active Transportation, um, you know, that I'm sure is is looking for advocates as well to to um, help with their um, mission. Um, you know, it's so going to you... take some funding. So, go ahead, Holly. Do you ever um, accept help from volunteers to help write grants or to help um, put a plan together or write op-ed pieces? You know, if there's something that's, you know, that you want to see moved forward, but there's opposition to, um, those are ways. I, Emily and I uh, work in New Haven, Connecticut, that, and it has a very active advocacy community that literally will will write the town's uh, the city's bike plan for them <laughs> in order to get it done um, I've written grants on behalf of the the city of New Haven um, to try to get funding for things um, so I, I I don't know if that's something that, that you've ever done before or or, or would entertain um, but I mean someone still obviously has to manage it and so it it really depends on your administrative, um, you know, bandwidth, I guess is the word, um, but just some ideas there. I, I really appreciate the question. I've been, um, yeah. you know, it, you, you, you care very much about these issues and, and really want to see them get done. And, and so do we, that's why we called it um, action plan. So <laughs> let, let's keep talking about that. I don't know. Yeah, Brandon. I think that BCAT has has played that role in writing advocacy letters, um, maybe not so much on behalf of the town, but just in their own advocacy. And I think that that's that's definitely helpful. Um, the, the grant writing, I mean, the town has a process for applying. So, you know, I think I, I would definitely, um, you know, appreciate volunteer grant writing, but it's still a process where we would need approval. So. You can't just go out and, and write grants uh, on behalf of the town. But and then I think, um, you know, I, I say this all the time and it's a little bit different. Um, Keene, New Hampshire, right, they've got a lot of off road trails. Um, bicycle, you know, kind of goes through downtown even so multi use paths. Um, I think it's they've established a really effective working relationship with the city of Keene, but this pathways for. Keen, which is like a nonprofit, and then they partner with the city. And so they do a lot of the fundraising to actually make the matches. So, um, you know, we, we talked about the town's budget here. Um, I think, you know, that that that's a really effective model. It's been easier for them to do it because they're all rails with trails. But um, if we want to see some of the larger projects, I think the um, ability to find the funding is is still, you know, one of our big challenges. Yeah. Well, it, it does seem like there there are more sources of the funding now, and um, you know we can we'll, we'll put some more thought into that as we write up the the report, the final report for this project. Yeah. 
Uh, there's a question. What does it mean for autom automobile drivers to share the road with cyclists? Some drivers treat bikes and pedestrians as co-equals. For example, some drivers wait until they can actually see oncoming traffic before passing a cyclist on a blind curve. Too often, drivers do not slow down in the least, hoping for the best as they cross a double line. If an oncoming car or truck appears, does Vermont driver education actually define what it means to safely share the road? Mm -hmm. um, I actually don't have the answer to that question. I don't know. Uh, not to put you on the spot, Alice, but I'm wondering if, if you know the answer to that, because I know you've done some bicycle education with um, uh, with students and, and whatnot. See so you unmuted, Alice. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um... Driver education is really very, um, in this area, because I attend a lot of the driver ed classes, is very proactive in, in teaching kids about how to share the road with cyclists. And they encourage the car motorists to take to take um, as much of the other lane as they need to when passing, because um, they consider us a slow-moving vehicle like a tractor. And the laws in Vermont state that you are allowed to cross the double yellow for, for instance, passing a tractor. Um, a farm vehicle if you need to. And um, so the, the driver education, I think, is the, of the of at BUHS um, is very good and very clear. And and Vermont statue also, it has a somewhat weak sound to it where it's called um, passing with due care, but it does encourage drivers, motorists to pass um, with increasing distance as their speed is increasing. So do you have a vulnerable users law in Vermont? We do. And that's what I'm also referring to. Really, the vulnerable users, um, the Vermont state law is, states that uh, and Molly can back me up or correct me if I'm saying it in error, is that um, passing any vulnerable user, uh, a Vermont motorist is supposed to use due care. And the due care is defined as at least three feet, but increasing as um, their speed increases. So that's what it yeah. is. It's not it's not the best vulnerable user law in the country, that's for sure. Uh, and there was some talk about, you know, making it a specific feet, but then, you know, law enforcement said it's really hard to, like, enforce that because you're not out there with a measuring tape. So it's, uh, it's complicated. It has, it has, was revised a few years ago. From 2010, I think when I first worked on that bill, yeah, um, and gotten a little bit better, but uh, and we did try to try to pass something where it would be also a the driver would be at fault if they um, hit somebody on a right turn, and that did not fly. But maybe in the future, which yeah. would have also helped a lot. Thank you, Alice and Molly. Um, I'm going to take two more questions with that are hands that are raised, but we um, it is 8.15. Thanks all for, for staying late. Um, so let's go with Zeke and then Andy Davis. And um, we'll, we're collecting all the chat comments, so we will also be reviewing them. Um, so Zeke. Are you there? Hi, I think my hand is just still up oh. from before. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for hanging in. Yeah, I, uh, I yeah. just I'll just oh. say that I I would love to um to stay connected to Molly Burke and other others who are working on this issue because it sounds like when considering you know, pedestrian safety, this is a neighborhood that um, often gets forgotten a part as a residential and pedestrian area, which is kind of the root of what makes it unsafe too with all the cars flying by and stuff. And I think that oftentimes, you know, people who are underprivileged class-wise don't necessarily um, 
you know, feel, expect to be heard and then might participate less. And that can also be like a negative feedback loop, just like the idea that this is in a pedestrian area, making it both more unsafe and less, you know, less, less in the scope of consideration. So, but I appreciate everyone's, all the work everyone's done. So I'm just going to say goodnight. I don't really know how to lower the hand raise symbol. Oh, right at the bottom of your screen, it says lower, it should say lower hand. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks a lot. Zoe. We appreciate you being here and um, definitely have heard thanks. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Andy. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Alice, I really appreciate you talking about driver ed because I've always been curious. I know there's a lot of variation in state law around this issue, um, but I just I'm speaking from my personal experience. I can think of a place like the top of Maple Street coming from Memorial Park up toward uh, Austin. Uh, if you're in the roadway, um, there's no shoulder. There's actually a rock outcropping and you're on the right hand side of the road and it's a curve and cars will come up behind me and just cross the double line having no idea what's coming the other way. And I know if a truck is coming the other way, they're gonna cut me off uh, before they hit the truck. So I find that that happens quite frequently on these bottlenecks where there's no shoulder. And cars, I, I sometimes feel like there's a commandment, thou shalt not speed, uh, thou shalt not slow down. And I personally, because I'm a cyclist, if I'm coming up to a bicyclist and I can't see what's coming the other way, I slow down and wait till I can see. Then I go all the way in the other lane. But I find too many cars just cross their fingers because I think they figure the bicycle is a soft target and if they have to cut it off, they will. Um, that's my follow up. But I do appreciate that it's covered in uh, working with our younger high school drivers and perhaps the next generation is a little more sensitive to it. So thank you. Thank you for the whole meeting. I appreciate it. I have a comment, yeah. on, but I know I wasn't on the queue because I couldn't raise my hand. But only oh, if, go ahead, Barry. Uh, am I? It, was there somebody else before me on the queue? I don't want to cut in. No, no. if I, may, I want to follow up. I was thinking what Andy said on my own. Um, you know, I first of all, I really appreciate from the first meeting to now. I see so much progress in the work that you've been doing. It's great. I would like to add, though, that if you can, in your reports and in your conversations, I'm feeling, and probably many others here are feeling, a sense of urgency, because there is a noticeable and statistical, up, you know, anecdotal and statistical uptick in bicycle accidents in the last number of years here, locally, and around the country, and in Britain. So I'm, I'm feeling very worried often, um, and it's only a matter of time till something happens worse than it has uh, because of all of these factors. What Andy said about coming around a curve I see on Chicken Coop Hill coming from Guilford all the time. People pass me and go into the other lane not seeing what's happening, and I'm, I have to take defense even though they gave me three feet because I don't know if a car is going to hit him or he's going to hit me, and it's very worrisome. Uh, the last part of my anecdote is that about six weeks ago, there was another bicycle, serious bicycle accident on Canal Street. Um, the, the person was airlifted, and um, I had six or seven people contact me by phone or email worrying that that was maybe me. I, I dodged a bullet that time. Somebody else got badly hurt. I think the whole reason why I'm on a bit of a soapbox here, and forgive me, is I, I would wish that you all in your reports can, um, uh, can convey a sense of urgency that many of us feel about getting these things moving. And I understand there are political and financial slowdowns that have to happen, but that's frustrating to me. And if maybe uh, more of those dollars can go to you and what you're proposing, because of this urgency, because of the statistical uptick in bicycle accidents all around, including in our community, 
maybe that sense of urgency will be listened to a little bit more if it's if it's in, included in the conversation. Th thank you for that comment, Barry. And it really resonates with us here in Connecticut where we just had seven pedestrian deaths in eight days um, right before the Thanksgiving holiday. And um, we're all heartbroken about that. It's, you know, it's, it's bicyclists and pedestrians and, um, we even though we didn't design those roads as as transportation planners, um, I, speaking for myself anyway, I can say feel um, I feel like my my um, profession has failed <laughs> my society. <laughs> so um, that's an excellent way to frame the the report discussion. I think I, I really appreciate that. It, the urgency is exactly the right word. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight or for zooming in. Um, really appreciate all your feedback and input and we look forward to um, incorporating it and um, kind of finalizing this plan and, and taking it to the select board. So um, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. When you will present that plan to the select board? We don't have a date yet for oh, okay. a select board presentation. Um, you know, it's they're in budget season, which in some ways is a really good thing, and in other ways is just a little bit tougher. I would think, um, you know, I need to check in with Holly and I need to check in with their scheduling. Um, I don't know if it'll be December or early January. Um, okay, but yeah, we'll, we'll need to kind of do some coordination. Um, if we have your email addresses, I don't know if we collected them. Um, we'll definitely, it was on the sheet, yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely keep those. Um, and if you're on chat and you want to drop us your email address, we can, um, you know, get in touch and let you know when that's happening too. All right. Great, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice evening.